All right, time to record another speed painting video. I better paint my nails because, you know, a chipped nail is almost as embarrassing as making a spelling error on a painting that you worked on for at least 10 hours and not noticing that you spelled Inktober wrong. English does Inktober, week two. So here I'm assembling all of my tools, a couple of different sorts of paint brushes, a big glass of water, um, I'm using a Trader Joe's marinara sauce jar, and my palette. Here we got Petunia. This week, Petunia has discovered -da 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 -da. the Bell Tower Bellflower. Hooray! Uh, <laughs> The Inktober prompt that I picked this week um, was Ring, which was the first day, but I got this really evocative image right away of a flower in a bell tower. And here you can see my thumbnails. Um, I did want to do a couple different approaches with this. Um, thumbnailing is a really important process when you're drawing something and you want to plan something out. So you do a couple of tiny drawings to kind of see where you want the values. Um, and to really figure out the composition. So I obviously favored, you know, the one with the giant bell. Oh, another important tool that I keep handy with me whenever I'm doing any sort of watercolors or water-based media is a paper towel. Um, you'll see probably later on in the video, I, whenever I put down the paint too heavy, I pick it up with a paper towel, and that just helps um, lift up any of the extra so I can get the right color, the right value that I want. Another thing about using acrylic inks is that you don't really know what the true color will look like on the paper until you actually, you know, water it down appropriately. Um, having a white palette helps this, but because my palette is such a mess, I always like to keep a spare piece of paper with me. Usually when the paper um, that I'm working with is big enough, I'll just have it off to the side, but because I'm only working on an 8x8 sheet, I have a separate sketchbook because I hoard sketchbooks. Um, and they actually come in handy here. Uh, I also use this time to try and figure out the palette, try and experiment. The palette that I wanted for this piece, I wanted to keep it pretty natural and earthy and um, shadowy. So I kind of went with like a cool green, gray, blue. When I was selecting the palette, I was also keeping in mind the sense of light and atmosphere that I wanted to create. Sometimes it turns out that the palette that I make, like the test sheet, is way prettier than the actual <laughs> illustration. And um, ain't that just the way. I use both painting, like traditional painting and digital painting, pretty evenly. I go back and forth between the two a lot and I try and mix them as much as possible when I'm not doing Inktober. Um, and one of the challenges of Inktober is reminding myself that I have wrist dexterity. <laughs> See, if I were doing this digitally, um, I would be using the lasso tool and I would just be selecting all of this negative space between these vines. But because this is the real life, I just have to do my best. And most importantly, always remember, make sure you take a break to stretch. This is one of my favorite uh, stretching techniques. <laughs> you just hold your wrist, uh, your hand in that position for like 10 seconds each, and we're back at it. Doing color commentary for my own artistic process is really funny to me. I'm, I'm trying it out, you guys. I also hope that I have a lot to learn looking back at the way that I do things, and I always thought especially when I'm working in Photoshop, but I've always thought that people would get frustrated watching me work <laughs> because it's a lot of back and forth. And as I was doing this, part of my thought process was dedicated to making sure that it was legible when people watched it. I knew that I wanted this wall to be the darkest, and that's why I painted it first. I wanted to set the darkest value in the picture first so that I knew what I should build away from in comparison, if that makes sense. There is something about just going back and forth with a brush and uh, being delicate with where you make your marks 
that I really miss when I'm painting digitally. Um, there are a lot of different ways to paint digitally too. I sure I'm talking about that a lot for an October video, huh? <laughs> Oh, oh, I use the paper towel. <laughs> so what you can see me doing right now is I'm already trying to build up a sense of space and light. Oh, by placing um, the values where I have. So like the inner edge of the archway is lighter because the light is coming from, it's the light is coming in from the outside. In this painting, I actually did something pretty new. I almost never use a pre-made black when I'm painting. It's just kind of a traditional thing to mix your own black. Um, but I had black in front of me, so I went for it. Um, and that's the ink that I actually put in my fountain pen. So when I first painted this wall, I was happy with the value, but I wasn't happy with the color. I'm going over a second layer with the acrylic inks to make it a little bluer, a little cooler. And that's actually a really cool feature of acrylic inks is that you can layer them and they don't pick back up again. If you're using watercolor and you tried to do this, it you'd have to be incredibly delicate and make sure it was really, really dry. But with acrylic inks, you can just slap them down. There's a lot more of a balancing act that's going on when you work traditionally, I feel. Because traditionally, you do something and there's no undo button. There are pros and cons to working different ways um, but one of the exciting things about like doing inktober is that i feel like i'm strengthening my decision making process by working in real life by working with a medium that's a little less forgiving than photoshop there's petunia she's so happy i did actually look up bellflower um, because i thought that it was a sort of flower and it is um, so I actually, I referenced the shape of that flower when I drew um, this big bell, but I didn't really innovate on the shape much. I did completely make up that vine root system thing that's happening. That's completely fictitious, but the hummingbird botanist isn't. She's very serious. I was excited about this ink that I picked up. I don't think you can tell in the video, but it's pearlescent. And I'm always looking for an excuse to make my paintings more glittery. So here I'm doing a similar approach to before, where before I really go in and render, I'm trying to get the darkest value in first, because the darkest one sets the standard for all the other values to be compared to. First I set the color, and then I established the darkest value. And now I'm going in and rendering the flower, trying to give it a little more texture. This is also an area where I feel I really should have used reference um, because I wanted the flower to look like it's made out of brass and it's not quite there. I was more just thinking of the way light would reflect off of a real flower and I had this vague idea of what I think metal looks like. But if I had looked up a brass bell, I think the form would have been a lot more accurate. I think the form would have been a lot more successful. You know how they say that like having a goldfish tank in your room is supposed to help you relax because watching the fish swim back and forth is soothing? I feel that way with watching people mix paint. <laughs> or even actually doing it. There's just some part of my brain that's like, ooh, yes, colors. So the rest of the video, I'm building up shadows. And the shadows are what really give the picture its sense of depth. I spent a lot of time very slowly pushing these vines further and further into the background. And I did that by having the temperature and the value of the vines be similar to that back wall. So I wanted them to be dark and I wanted them to be cool. And I wanted the bell to be a little more saturated. I wanted the, co the color to be brighter and just a little bit warmer than these bluey grays. If you 
enjoyed watching me play with some ink, you might also enjoy our partner, Inked Gaming. They make awesome gaming merch like playmats, mouse pads, t-shirts, and more, all with designs by independent artists. Use the link in the description and the code SUBJECTIVELY10 at checkout for a 10% discount off your entire purchase. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if I've ever made a full narrative illustration exclusively with ink and acrylic. So that's actually really exciting, because that's something I've wanted to do for so long and I was so afraid of doing it. I'm not sure why I love art more than anything else in the world, but it's also such a terrifying thing for me. Um, I think a lot of people feel that way. And I think the best way to get over it is to just keep going. It's one of those things where I'm kind of afraid to start until I'm five minutes in and all the fear is gone and I'm just in the zone. And then I really love what I'm doing. So here is a good example of that, I think. It takes me a long time to build up the values to where I want them to be. Um, I had a very delicate approach to it because it's ink and you can't take it back once it's down on the page. So I think that's something that'll only, I'll become more confident with it the more I do it. Yet another reason why I'm excited to be doing Inktober. Another thing that I was excited to do in this is I used a lot of muted colors. Um, that's just not something that I do too often. I always want to go like bright, fun, poppy, like that's my first instinct always, but what really makes a piece interesting and moody is when it's like 80% muted colors and 20% like a color that pops. A good variety is what makes a picture interesting. Hold on real quick, I have to send Jack a gif of this toddler dancing. Okay, cool, I'm back. Here I'm trying to build contrast between the character and the light source she's standing directly in front of. <laughs> I think this is another section where I probably could have done a little bit better, gone a little harder, been a little less afraid of that shadow, but we'll get there. Lighting in a scene carries such emotional weight, so it's something I really want to get better at using. Oh, okay, so this part is I wanted to establish the setting um, through a really tiny window, <laughs> and it's kind of overexposed, so it's a little hard to see right now, but you'll see at the end. Um, I wanted to kind of establish that this was like a big tower in a quaint little village, but I just wanted to give just like the littlest hint of a village. I didn't want to put too much detail or value in it um, because that's not the most important part of the painting. This is just like an added detail to give context. It's not the first thing you should be looking at when you see this. So I used a low value range. And finally, it's the moment of truth. I'm busting out the fountain pen. I'm like really new to using fountain pens, but um, after using a lot of brush pens, I was like, I'm burning through these babies so quick and they're just gonna sit in a landfill so why don't I use something a little more sustainable um, and I realized fountain pens can have sort of a similar effect that I'm looking for um, but it's a nice mix because I would always go back and forth between wanting to use microns and you know nice thin microns or fat juicy brush pens and um, I really like having um, line variation I'm using a Noodler pen, it's the Ahab Flex. Um, I thought it'd be a good starter pen, and it's my favorite color. All right, here goes nothing. Something really nice that happened with this, and I'm not really sure why it did happen, but I like it, is uh, the black ink sort of fades into the picture. <laughs> instead of being heavy and sitting on top of it. It's okay. Nick just broke one of my glasses, I think. <laughs> I love doing fiddly line work like this. I don't know why. There's some part of my brain that just loves doing a lot of little lines going in different directions. 
I was trying to use the line work to suggest light a little bit too. So where the light is hitting the vines, I have less lines and they're a little more heavy handed and uh, dense in the shadows. And that's just to try and give the suggestion of form as well. Come in quick. I'm still recording. Oh, okay, wait. I'm what? Okay, what happened? Um, Nick. Wait, Cole, want to say hi? Are you recording right now? Yeah. What? What? Maybe cut it out? Maybe. I'm recording. I'm trying. Is it recording right now? Yes, it is actively recording. Do you have anything to say to any are of the subjectivists? I don't know. Are you going to cut it out being you so noisy? Why? We talked about chili. <laughs> I dropped your mouse on the floor. Are you going to leave this in? <laughs> How could I? You're not? the subjectivist. Don't need to know about the chili we made. <laughs> We made chili. It was delicious. <laughs> they don't want to know the recipe. They can't know the recipe. Kidney and black beans, no, some no, ground no, beef, no, crushed recipe. tomatoes. No, no. He forgot some garlic. There's some garlic in it. And pepper. Oh yeah, peppers. You gotta and have. Thyme. Of course. I saved outlining Petunia for last because. One, she's on the right side of the page, and I'm right-handed, so I didn't want to smudge anything. And two, that was the scariest part. Here is the final illustration. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm curious to know what you guys are doing for your Inktober projects. If you are, totally cool if you're not. But if you are, let me know if there's any sort of art topic that you'd like me to discuss. And thank you so much for watching. Bye. I don't think I said we're back. I don't think I said I'm back.